Thank you very much for being here. This is the last of the last, so I appreciate your patience. And uh, um, I also want to briefly tell you that I'm not going to talk about uh, mapping risk. So uh, if you're not interested, you can leave. But <laughs> I hope you will enjoy anyway the, the talk. So I'm talking about, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this animal, this Puma, mountain lion, cougar, you may be familiar with it, but it has the longest, one of the longest uh, lists uh, of uh, names, of common names uh, of all mammals uh, worldwide. And it also has uh, one of the largest uh, distribution ranges of all mammals. So it spreads uh, through most of uh, the American continent, uh, from central Canada to the southernmost tip of South America and across a range of habitats uh, and uh, landscapes. And throughout all this huge range, uh, conflicts happen, happens very frequently. These are just some of the papers, uh, scientific papers, reporting uh, conflicts uh, with livestock. I will only talk about conflict with livestock, not conflict with humans, which is uh, another important uh, issue. But it's, uh, as we heard before, it's very localized uh, uh, geographically and uh, it's a quite different topic. So I'm going to focus on uh, conflict with livestock. Uh, as I told you, they are very widespread uh, across the entire distribution range of pumas. And they also appear to be increasing, uh, as the study from uh, Chile uh, seems to show increasing temporarily, so becoming uh, more frequent uh, and more uh, important uh, recently. So we started asking us a few questions to try to uh, detect patterns, pattern, common patterns uh, in this phenomenon. So we started uh, with uh, trying to understand what is the impact for uh, livestock uh, um, ranchers for ranchers or farmers uh, of the attacks of pumas. And uh, we, most of the data I'm going to show you is based on uh, a search of the academic databases, uh, so a literature search and review. But there is also some original data here mixed up. So, what we saw is that uh, there is very little information uh, about uh, quantifying the real damage that uh, is caused by pumas on livestock production. And uh, what we found is here, as you can see, the number of cases uh, uh, on the top of the bars are kind of small, but uh, the productive units, uh, with productive units, I mean ranches or farms, uh, affected by Puma's attacks uh, can be great. So it, uh, the, the average uh, is about 39%. The mean uh, percentage of head lost by Puma's with respect to the total, uh, uh, the total livestock uh, in a ranch uh, is small, 6.6%. But uh, uh, it's a great proportion of the total losses uh, uh, suffered uh, and endured by, uh, by livestock uh, ranchers. However, these are mean values. And if we look a little bit deeper, we see that there is a, there is a huge variation uh, in these values. So for instance, the percentage of uh, ranches with losses uh, ranges from uh, 1.7 to 87.5% of all the ranches in a given area. So it can range between almost none to almost all of them. The mean and maximum uh, percentage of head lost uh, is also very variable from no losses at all to 32%, which is a great proportion for someone raising cattle. And also the, the economic loss, where we have a particularly very little information, tends to be very variable. So the conclusion, what is the conclusion? Is that in some cases, losses can be very, very relevant, especially for the local people affected by them, of course. 
And uh, this is even worse uh, if we take into account the surplus killing, which is a phenomenon which appears to happen very frequently across different species of carnivores, most of the carnivores for what we know, but it's very little studied. And also with Puma, it was hard to find uh, reliable information. We were able only to find 12% of the uh, of the records that we had mentioning uh, surplus killing, and we think it's much more widespread than that. And only three studies with quantitative data that we could use to, to try to find out uh, what was the importance of surplus killing. And so, as you can see, uh, surplus killings appear to affect between uh, 25 and 33 percent uh, of the ranches of the farms. And the number of individual killed can be between two and 160 per event, per attack. So this is, there is some evidence uh, that uh, uh, local people tends to uh, overestimate this kind of uh, damage. We are not sure, but there is some indication that this is the case. But still, when uh, you get uh, a situation like that uh, and the rancher sees something what I'm showing uh, you in this photo, the impact on their perception, on their attitudes, on their behavior towards pumas is strongly affected and it becomes very, very negative. So let's move on. What is the importance of uh, livestock for pumas? So we went to study the diet of pumas. We found uh, this is a larger uh, uh, database uh, from uh, 15 countries, uh, which is a great proportion of the countries where pumas are found, and uh, with a large variation of uh, 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 situation or context and habitats. We found that pumas can uh, forage, can feed on uh, 200, 211 different uh, species, mostly mammal. 80% of uh, those species are mammals. However, they can, only, they can also feed on uh, 12 domesticated species, as in this case that you can see there. So domesticated livestock uh, appears relatively frequently in 44% of uh, study sites. But the mean percentage of occurrence is only 5.4%. However, if you look at uh, the, the same data, but only from uh, the sites where uh, predation of livestock occurs, the percentage goes up to 12%. So what does this mean? Uh, is livestock uh, a main prey for pumas or not? First, we had to define what a main prey is. We used the two different uh, variables, uh, the mean percentage of occurrence in diet and the number of study sites where the, this kind of, any kind of prey occurs. We built uh, a, a list of 31 different species that are distributed like this uh, with the two variables that I just mentioned. So the ones that I'm showing are probably the most uh, important species for uh, pumas uh, worldwide, I mean across their entire range, and uh, cattle and sheep are there. So they are part of this list of 31 species that can be considered main prey species, but they are not among the most important ones. Another question that we wanted to ask, and uh, so can we find some uh, common points uh, on uh, all the areas that are affected by conflict? This is again a difficult task because uh, there is a lot of academic uh, information, but not many papers that can really be used to try to extract useful information. However, we found some uh, uh, some common points. So conflicts tend to occur. It's not, this is not the intensity, it's the occurrence of conflicts in areas with uh, more, a greater density of cattle with uh, a, a smaller number of co-predators 
and uh, that are less distant, uh, closest, closer to uh, areas with trees and shrubs. And the two main uh, variables are really livestock density. So where the density of livestock uh, is greater, the probability of occurrence of uh, uh, conflicts is also greater. And uh, uh, conflicts tend to occur in areas uh, where there are trees and shrubs, essentially. These are the only really uh, interesting uh, findings that we were able uh, to take out from this review. So what are the consequences of conflict for pumas? Now we first look at the consequences for humans, and now we move to the consequences of conflict for pumas. And these are uh, more information that we personally collected through interviews uh, in different areas of Argentina, different uh, uh, ecoregions, including uh, the Patagonian and the Dry Chaco, which covers very large uh, extents of areas. And what we found is that uh, lethal methods uh, are still uh, used a lot by ranchers. They go out uh, and uh, kill pumas. And when we ask them if they do kill pumas, yeah, they say in many opportunities they do it. So the consequence for pumas of conflict is this. This is how pumas end because of conflict. But does killing pumas reduce conflicts? And with this I finished. I am not going through specifically this information because there is very little information out there. It's contradictory, but uh, it shows that uh, we don't really have evidence that killing pumas reduces the density of puma and uh, or reduces the conflict uh, with pumas. So with this, I finished. Uh, let me thank uh, the Conservation Leadership Program uh, that gave me a travel grant uh, that enabled me to be here. And uh, I'm here for your questions. <laughs> We have time for three questions. Okay, questions for Mauro. I was either very clear or very boring. <laughs> Thank um, Great, it's great uh, to see both sides and everything. So what are the next steps mainly? Like, especially like now you, I mean, it, it seems that there is some impact uh, on the livestock. We see that there is uh, killing from humans uh, to puma, but it seems that, if I understand correctly, the killing uh, on puma so far is not really showing uh, an effect uh, on puma population. Is that I understand correctly? No, no. I didn't okay. say that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was not clearly, maybe. Maybe it was the last part. Yeah, um, there is still very little information, as I said, <laughs> about the effect of puma hunting on their populations. But we know that uh, puma were wiped off some uh, very large geographic areas, like the whole uh, southern Patagonia, the entire Patagonia of uh, Argentina. And so we know that hunting can have a dramatic effect on their population. And so, yes, this is a call to do something. And we, my team and other colleagues, are trying to test mitigation, um, mitigation interventions. But I think that it was important to have an idea of what we know and what we need to know more. And especially try to find out what are the common points, because there are many studies, uh, also some of my previous colleagues mentioned it, there are, some, may, there are many studies looking at the picture locally, where you can uh, find some patterns, but are these patterns uh, 
uh, can this pattern be used to a, for a greater scale, a geographic scale? And so, yeah, we found out that there is some common pattern, and so that, that should be taken into account when uh, planning a conservation. But in the end, uh, we have, you have to act locally, for sure. One more question. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask, on your last point, you were talking about um, getting, um, doing interviews with the communities to find out on their attacks on, on the people. So I just wanted to find out, how do you get them to be secure enough to give you that information? Because it's very easy for them to just say, we don't kill them, <laughs> we're afraid of the law. And yeah, and do you also collate that with data from the national parks or anything that tell you how many of the animals have been killed in retaliation? Okay, there are almost no data out there uh, in uh, most of the countries. There are some, uh, some countries that collect this information, but it, it's kind of little reliable because the proportion of people reporting uh, the losses is very, very low. So it's not really reliable. And with respect to the first question, uh, it's not very difficult to get reliable answers from ranchers because they simply think that uh, they have uh, all the right of doing anything uh, they want within their land. It's interesting because in some of the areas where we work, uh, killing puma is prohibited by law. It's forbidden, it's illegal. But still, they have really no problems mentioning it uh, because there is no law enforcement at all. And so they just uh, let you know. However, we go there and we don't tell we are from the government, we are here to control what is going on. We try to be as uh, independent uh, as possible and let them know that we want to try to understand what's the problem, what's their problem, to listen to them, and then try to find solution that they can apply. Which this is the, the most important thing, I think, that we have to do when approaching uh, local people. 